Hello, I'm Professor Michael McCarthy. I'm very sorry I can't be with you in person today for what would have been our workshop together, but I hope you enjoy this video. In the video, we're going to look at the advanced level for learners and how corpora can help us better understand the advanced level and what we can do to help our students at that level. There are several discussion points that I would like to raise during this presentation, and they are the following. If we consider the uh, advanced level to be approximately from the top of the B level of the Common European Framework of Reference, the CEFR, going into levels C1 and C2, in what way are these levels different from the lower levels, B1, A2, A1? Are they similar but just more difficult, or is there something different about them? The second discussion point is, what really are the needs of advanced level learners, the typical needs of learners once they have crossed that threshold to the higher level? And, of course, the final question, how can we meet those needs and help our students? Let's have a look at some of the issues which arise when we consider the advanced level. Firstly, there is a surprising lack of consensus in uh, syllabuses and materials and pedagogical treatment at this level. It's quite different from the lower levels, especially the beginner and elementary levels, where everyone is more or less agreed what has to be done. We know where to start. We know what the basic grammatical structures are. We know what the core vocabulary is that learners need to learn immediately. However, when we come up to the advanced level, there seems to be no agreement on what a really good advanced level syllabus would look like. And in my own research, I've looked at a number of course books and advanced level programs and found quite a considerable variation across the board. Now, this may or may not be a good thing, but it is a point to note. We all know that vocabulary is probably the biggest single task that our uh, learners face at whatever level. And one of the problems that we'll be looking at is that at the advanced level, the vocabulary seems to be bigger than ever. It just seems to go on continuously. We never reach a point where we can say we have learnt the vocabulary of a language like English. The vocabulary, if you like, becomes a vast sea of items in which the learner is trying desperately to swim and to hold on to things. In the case of the grammar, what often happens is the learner loses that sense of progression which they have at the lower levels. Progression is quite rapid in grammar from the beginner level to the B levels. And one works one's way through a series of grammatical items and structures which give a real sense of progress and growth. At the advanced level, it may be the case that our learners feel they have done most of the grammar. What is there left to learn at the advanced level in terms of grammar? So that's another important question. Finally, there's the question of assessment and assessment targets. And it's generally agreed in the research that at the advanced level, it becomes actually more difficult to test someone adequately. So a beginner can display a lot of their knowledge in quite a short text, a 100 or 200 word composition, for example. But when we get to the advanced level, if we set the same sorts of task, one rather limited essay, even if it is 250 or 300 words, or even 500 words, 
the learner does not necessarily get sufficient opportunity to display his or her knowledge because the knowledge they have at that level is quite considerable. Uh, this is uh, something that uh, James Milton has discussed in his 2009 paper and also an interesting paper by Paula Buttery and Andrew Keynes in 2012 at the University of Cambridge here in the United Kingdom who looked at what they call opportunity for use. So in other words, are we giving our learners sufficient opportunities to show, to display the knowledge that they have. So let's start by looking at vocabulary. As I've mentioned, this is the biggest single task. One of the problems with vocabulary is that the more you learn, the less you seem to cover the new language which you encounter. Let me explain this more simply. If you learn a couple of thousand words from the beginner level, and you do this over two years maybe, you will find that you can understand or you have already encountered more or less 80% of all of the words that are contained in ordinary everyday texts, such as newspaper texts or magazines or websites or books. Uh, we're not talking about highly technical vocabulary here. The problem is that as you learn more, the amount of text that your vocabulary can cover becomes less, considerably less. If we look at this graph here, we will see, for example, that the first 2,000 words as I've already mentioned, gives you about 80% coverage. The second 2,000, that is if you go on learning, you stay for another year and learn another thousand, then another year, learn another thousand, etc. So for example, it might be five or six years of secondary school. The returns that you get, the amount of text that you can comprehend, the number of words that you have already seen becomes less and less and less. And so even with 10,000 words in your vocabulary, you're still quite a long way from the 100% comprehension level. However, native speakers themselves don't have 100% comprehension, but it's generally accepted among researchers that something like 97% is a good total to aim at. Because if you think of it, if you can only understand 90% of the words in a new text, then one in every 10 words will be a word you've never seen before. If that is the case, it becomes almost impossible to continue to read with motivation. You will give up. There are just too many unusual, unknown words. If you achieve 95%, then there are still 1 in 20 new words in the text that you're likely to encounter. So the task is great, and we need to look, therefore, for other possible solutions. One of the things that we know about vocabulary learning at the advanced level is that the focus moves from what we call the paradigmatic to the syntagmatic. By this I mean the paradigmatic is the contrast in meaning between different words. So for example, red does not mean the same as green or as blue or as yellow. They are in a paradigm of colour words. The syntagmatic refers to how words go together. So for example in English we talk about someone having blonde hair as a colour, but we can't apply that colour to uh, the colour of our car or our jacket or the walls of our house. We have to say a beige car or a, a beige jacket or beige coloured walls. 
and we cannot say he or she has beige hair. So these are syntagmatic questions. They are questions of collocation. They are questions of how words combine. In addition to collocation, when words combine, they often fuse together to form chunks, lexical bundles, lexical clusters, different names that we have for them. And these also become very important as we move up the levels in vocabulary. Then there is the question of register and connotation and style. These also become more important at the advanced level in the matter of vocabulary. Uh, for example, the distinctions between the vocabulary of speaking and the vocabulary of writing, levels of formality and so on. Another interesting fact about the advanced level is that generally around the world we can see a growth in what I've called domain specificity. That is that the beginner and lower level learners are generally concerned with learning what we might call general English, improving their general proficiency. As we get towards the advanced levels, learners normally have more specified goals. For example, they may want to study uh, in an English-speaking academic environment to study academically through the medium of English. They may need in the future to use English in business. For all sorts of reasons, the goals become narrower and more specified. On the more negative side, there's some evidence at the advanced level of slowdown in learning and even attrition even going backwards, in other words, forgetting what you've already learned. So there may be an important question of the extent to which you can recycle vocabulary from the earlier levels, and that's not a simple, straightforward matter. Connected with that problem is the problem of fossilized error. Well, everyone makes errors when they use uh, second or foreign languages, but the evidence from learner corpora, and we'll have a look at some of that uh, very soon, the evidence from learner corpora is that errors can become fossilized. They become entrenched. They become very difficult to change, to dislodge in some way. And this problem obviously becomes more acute the longer time that these errors persist. So let's start to look at some more corpus evidence. We're going to have a look at um, some examples here of binomial expressions. These are syntagmatic expressions where two items are joined together usually by the word and. Familiar items would be things like uh, fish and chips or black and white photographs. So the two items are joined together and their order is normally fixed. We don't say chips and fish. We don't say white and black. In English, we say black and white. Here we can see some errors that learners have made at levels up to the C2 level of the Common European Framework of Reference. Tear and wear instead of where and tear. Wide and far, instead of far and wide. Cons and pros, instead of pros and cons. And one I've already mentioned, white and black photographs, instead of black and white. Bones and skin, instead of skin and bones, when somebody is emaciated and thin. And there are many such examples where the advanced level learner is learning an advanced level expression but has got the word order the wrong way around and these errors persist it's very difficult to dislodge them it's a question of memory it's a question of habit here we can see a concordance for the word information 
which in English is an uncountable noun, therefore it's not used in the plural. One common mistake that learners make is indeed to use it in the plural. And we find this error at lower levels when the word is first learned. But rather disappointingly, we still find strong evidence of it at the highest level, at the C2 level of the Common European Framework. And on the screen, the concordance that you can see, each line is taken from a student essay. And in the center there, we will see the word informations, plural, and then the correction information, the correct form following it. So we see quite a number of this particular error. It's a very common fossilized error. Other errors in the question of countable and non-countable nouns come with words which are probably learnt later than a word such as information. On this screen we see an example of the word feedback, which again is an uncountable noun in English. And here we have examples of learners using it again in the plural, mistakenly. So what we have here is evidence of uh, the problem of fossilization, but there are two dimensions to it. One is fossilization of words learned earlier on, which persist and persist and persist. And the second is the danger of fossilization with words which are learned later, and it often occurs. So the question is, what can we do about this kind of fossilization? In the materials that I've been very fortunate to uh, publish with my co-authors, we've tried to tackle this problem by combining a recycling of old material with the presentation of new material. And this was done deliberately because learners don't like to think that they're constantly going back over the same old stuff. It goes back to this question of the feeling of progression of going forward, continuing to learn new things. So on this screen here, you will see an example of how we have combined uh, items which the learners are already familiar with, but which they are making errors with, along with more recent and newer words. And in the common errors box, we actually insert information directly from the corpus. We want to share this information with the learners. It's not something that researchers and teachers keep to themselves. So now let's look at some other remedies that have been proposed and research that has been carried out into this problem of gaining vocabulary more rapidly at the advanced level. Well, one of the most obvious things we can do is to enable the learner to uh, study in a second or foreign language environment. And programs which allow students to do a study year abroad are highly significant in this respect. Research has shown that study abroad programs can enable learners to increase their vocabulary by about 2,500 words per year spent abroad, and that's a considerable gain. But another angle, another way forward, relates to what I mentioned earlier. That is this question of specializing, of entering more specialized domains. And here I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, specialist word lists, in particular uh, word lists for academic English. One of the best known of these word lists is the academic word list, the AWL, uh, put together by Avery Coxhead in New Zealand. And the AWL is a remarkable resource uh, which consists of 570 word families which are common in academic English. And 
learning these 570 items has been shown to give the learner a 10% increase in their comprehension of academic texts. Quite an enormous jump forward, 10%. As we saw earlier on the graph about typical vocabulary progression, after the first couple of thousand words, progress may be down to 3% or 2% or 1%, even for learning a thousand words. So learning half that number in a specialist domain gives you a massive increase in your comprehension and uh, text coverage of the vocabulary that you have studied. Another such resource more recently is the OPAL word lists. O-P-A-L stands for Oxford Phrasal Academic Lexicon. This is a computerized word list and phrase list which I was very fortunate to be uh, able to work on in the creation of it. The OPAL resource is particularly useful because it is online, it is free, available to anybody, and is very easy to navigate. In the OPAL lists, we focus not just upon single words, but also academic phrases and chunks, which satisfies that need for syntagmatic learning as well as paradigmatic learning. The next question I want to look at is the question of the distinction between breadth of vocabulary learning and depth of vocabulary learning. Uh, Chen, a scholar who published in 1999 addressing this question, says a large vocabulary would probably not take a reader very far if his or her knowledge of this vocabulary was shallow and superficial. The point that Chen was uh, making here is that it doesn't matter how many words you know or phrases you know, what really matters is what you know about those words and phrases and how to use them. So at the advanced level, the task is to develop not just breadth of vocabulary, not just constantly increasing the number of words the learner knows, but actually exploring knowledge about those words and how they are used. So among the features of a word which we might consider important would be obviously the meaning, but also subsenses of the word, connotations of the word, and what we might call the semantic prosody of the word. Semantic prosody means the typical environments in which we find it. So, for example, the English adverbial intensifier utterly tends overwhelmingly to be found in environments of negative situations and negative ideas. So we find utterly ridiculous, utterly outrageous utterly appalling. It can be used in positive situations, but it tends overwhelmingly to be associated with negative situations. Then, of course, there is the question of register, and register will include the difference between speaking and writing, words which are appropriate in uh, speech rather than writing, and levels of formality. So, for example, we have words like kids, children, and offspring, which all mean more or less the same thing, but have great differences in their levels of formality, with offspring being rather formal, and kids being rather informal, and children being somewhat neutral. Now, I've already mentioned the question of collocation and the formation of chunks. Here on this screen, we'll see some corpus evidence for the frequency of chunks and how their frequency compares with the frequency of single words, which I'm absolutely sure you all teach to your students and you want your students to know. 
notably, some chunks are more frequent than everyday single words. And this is significant and it shows us the importance of focusing on chunks and giving our learners access to uh, information about the most frequent, most useful chunks in English. Chunks include colourful idioms, but sometimes I think we focus too much on the colourful idioms at the expense of the ordinary, everyday chunks which we use in conversation and writing. Before we move away from vocabulary, I'd just like to mention one final important resource. It is the English Vocabulary Profile, which is often called the EVP. It is a corpus-informed resource. It's online and it's free. And it offers the possibility of a principled organization of the learner lexicon right up to the highest levels of the Common European Framework of Reference, CFR, uh, C1 and C2. The English vocabulary profile is based on in-depth research into thousands of learner essays from all around the world, essays which were written for the Cambridge examinations. In creating the English vocabulary profile, the researchers looked at how learners progressed across the levels, typically around the world. So what it gives us is a picture of typical learners in many, many different countries. What they know, what they are able to use, not necessarily what they can understand, their passive vocabulary, which will always be bigger, but their active vocabulary, what they can use and what they have used in their essays and other kinds of writing in examinations. This is a particularly useful resource because it gives you the opportunity to see how your learners at this high level compare with learners from many different places around the world. And that's quite a useful resource. It's a kind of benchmark against which you can judge your own learners. Well, let's move on to grammar now. On the question of grammar, there are a number of things that we can do to give our learners that feeling of progression and growth, which they often feel they lack at the advanced level. One thing we can do is to look at new functions for forms which our learners already know. So they know the form, they know the grammar, the structure, and what we can do is to look at other functions which they have not necessarily uh, learnt for that particular uh, form or structure. The reverse of that coin is to look at new forms for functions which our learners are already familiar with. An example there would be the way that imperatives can sometimes be used to create a conditional meaning. So our learners are familiar with the notion of conditionality, using words like if and unless and so on. But they may not be aware that in certain kinds of writing, imperative forms can also have a conditional function. So in this example, we see an imperative verb, go, functioning to mean if you go. Go into any supermarket and you will see certain items displayed at children's level to encourage them to buy. Another aspect of grammar at the advanced level is the 
focus on low frequency structures. That is structures which exist in the language but which are not very common but which our learners may be ready to learn at this point in their progression. Finally, I would like to look at a very special set of patterns which are ways in which the learner can improve their uh, academic and professional and vocational writing to achieve greater success. This is based on research which was done at the University of Cambridge and I'll come back to that a little later. Let's start by looking at uh, a structure which learners normally learn to manipulate when they get up to the higher levels. It is the structure that is typically called the future perfect. And you may like to ponder for a little on how you typically teach this form, the future perfect. Uh, for example, in the sentences, we will have left or they will have been working. Let's have a look now at a couple of examples of this future perfect form. It's formed with the verb will or shall plus have plus the what we call the ed form in the simple aspect. So for example, I will have finished my exams by then. This is a person looking forward into the future to a date and at that point that person's examinations will finish. They will already have finished. Uh, the continuous form is will or shall plus have plus been plus the ing form. This is the continuous or progressive aspect. She will have been working for us for 10 years on March the 1st. Once again we're looking forward in time to March the 1st and at that point this person will have completed 10 years of working for the company. So let's have a look at some examples of this form but with a quite different function or meaning. The first example, you will have heard about the terrible earthquake. The second example is one I heard myself when I came to a workshop at a conference and the speaker stood up and said you will have been given a handout as you enter the room. And the third one is from newspaper. The government will have been hoping for better export figures. And the interesting thing about these three examples that we see here is that all three of them refer to events that have already happened not to events which are going to happen in the future. The earthquake has already happened, uh, the handout has already been given, and the government has already been hoping for better export figures. So what we have here is the speaker or writer making an assumption about the present or even the past situation. So clearly this form, the will have been and will have with the past participle, has quite a different function from looking forward to a point in the future. And if we look at corpus evidence, we see that this is an extremely common pattern. On the screen now you can see a concordance for this will have been and the ing form line after line after line from different texts show us that this function of making assumptions is extremely common. So what we can do here is we can take a form which our learners may already be familiar with 
and teach them and let them practice new or different functions. Now let's have a look at some low frequency patterns in English. And I'm going to take the example of the English subjunctive, which is formed with a verb plus that, uh, plus a subject, plus the base form of the verb. That is, a form of the verb that does not inflect for tense or person or number. So in this example here, they insist that he wear his uniform at all times. We can see that the base form of the verb is used. We don't say he wears, which would be the inflected form, or that he wore, which would also be an inflected form. Instead, we have the base form that he wear. She requested that they not come to a decision before interviewing more candidates. This example here shows the past uh, negative form, which again is simply the base form of the verb with not in front of it, without a do auxiliary. Now, this you will find in advanced level course books. This is the most common pattern that is, uh, that, that is taught. But that function of the subjunctive also is often found with a different set of forms. So we're going now from function to new forms. And if we look at our corpus, we find a large number of examples of subjunctive verb forms which are preceded not by uh, verbs like insist or request, but actually noun forms. Looking at this screen here, this concordance where each line comes from a different text, we find words such as question, demand, requirement, suggestion, stipulation, condition, consensus. And these are all noun forms which generate the subjunctive. And what they have in common is that they all express some kind of deontic meaning. Deontic meaning are meanings connected with obligation, necessity, desirability, and so on. But similarly, we find in our concordances subjunctives generated by adjectives. Here we see crucial, important, fitting, advisable, appropriate, imperative. And these, again, are adjectives which express those deontic meanings of necessity, obligation, desirability, how the situation should be, as opposed to how the situation is. So we have here an example of new forms for a function which your learners may already know. And those forms are noun-generated subjunctives and adjective-generated subjunctives. So what we can do is we can take a rather low-frequency, somewhat obscure grammatical item and build it into a, a very substantial syllabus item, something which the learners can get their teeth into, which they can work with, which they will perceive as something which is useful, much more uh, adaptable and usable than simply giving them one form, one pattern to express this particular function. In the case of uh, vocabulary, I mentioned uh, an online uh, resource, the English Vocabulary Profile, as one possible solution to the question of how we approach the advanced level. There is also a similar resource created by a team of researchers who were involved in the same project as the uh, English Vocabulary Project, and that is the English Grammatical Profile, the EGP, uh, which is uh, work done again at uh, Cambridge uh, based on the Cambridge Learner Corpus. The English Grammar Profile, the EGP, is a corpus-derived resource indicating typical grammatical profiles 
in the common European framework of reference. So just as the English vocabulary profile showed you how learners typically use vocabulary at the different levels of the common European framework of reference, this does the same for grammar. So again, it's very useful. It enables you to have a benchmark to see how your learners compare with thousands of learners all around the world. A very useful resource. By looking at the English Grammar Profile, you can see how your learners compare with the rest of the world. Finally, I want to look at some uses of language which can bring greater academic or professional or vocational success. I'm going to look at two particular aspects of writing here. The first is nominalization, and the second is to look at certain types of modality. Nominalization is defined as the process of expressing as a noun phrase entities normally realized by verb or adjective or adverb phrases. This is also sometimes known as grammatical metaphor, taken from the work of the uh, British linguist Michael Halliday. Here are a couple of examples. We can say we fly at seven o'clock this evening, or we can say our flight is at seven o'clock this evening, where the notion of the action of flying is encoded in the noun phrase, our flight. Mr. Hampson donated $2,000 can also be expressed as Mr. Hampson made a donation of $2,000 where the action of donating is expressed in the noun donation. And the interesting thing about uh, nominalization is that it has been found by research using computational analysis of large amounts of student writing. It has been found that raters, examiners, the markers are unconsciously affected by the presence or absence of certain types of language. It is not that the examiners uh, sit down and look specifically for these features, but statistically these features are correlated with higher marks when they are present and lower marks if they are not present. So what we've tried to do with our advanced level materials is to give learners practice in for example, nominalization. On this screen here, you see an extract from uh, the materials which I have co-authored, uh, where learners are given the task of writing their curriculum vitae, their CV, their personal profile, which is an important document when they apply for jobs or for academic places, and how they can use nominalization to create this improved style, this professional academic style, which they may not be aware of. So, for example, 
Instead of saying, I was interested in business in high school, you can say, my interest in business began in high school. Instead of saying, I was responsible for writing reports, we can say, my responsibilities included writing reports. Instead of saying, I decided to do this internship, you can say, the decision to do this internship was based on whatever, whatever. Students then get the opportunity to uh, practice this process of nominalization, this way of changing things to uh, a noun phrase. And once they get used to the idea, then it becomes part of their grammatical uh, toolkit, if you like, part of the equipment that they know they can use to improve their writing. But it's not something you often find in uh, textbooks and courses at the advanced level. Similarly, with modality, research shows that, in a curious sort of way, if you double up on modality, you create a more professional impression to your reader. And this is done typically by adding a modal adverb, an adverb with modal meaning, to a modal verb. So, for example, instead of just saying will, you can say will certainly. Instead of just saying could, we can say could possibly. Instead of just saying might, we can say might well. So here again we have examples of this double modality and giving learners the opportunity to practice that modality but also noting some potential errors in this area all based on the uh, learner corpus. We also have on the same page uh, information about writing versus conversation, this question of um, grammatical register. So we can do a lot. We can give a coherent structured approach to uh, these problems of grammar. So we're coming to the end of our time together and I'd just like to draw a few basic conclusions. Firstly, I would like to sum up by saying that the advanced level need not be an incoherent uh, area of language learning where we have no sense of where we are going uh, and where we are taking our learners and our learners themselves have no sense of progression and coherence and an organized syllabus. The advanced level can be principled and organized coherently. And both grammar and vocabulary can be targeted in this coherent way. Um, the resources which are free and online, the English vocabulary profile, the English grammar profile, the OPAL word lists and so on, these are things which enable us to present corpus-based information to our learners, which is reliable information about how the language operates at all its different levels, and especially in uh, the present case, how the language operates at the more advanced level in terms of structures and enabling our learners still to feel that there is progression in their learning of vocabulary and grammar. I would just like to conclude by saying that I hope you've enjoyed 
this presentation and that you are able to find things in it which are useful and which will help you to teach learners as they come into the advanced level that you and they will feel that you can progress coherently with an organized syllabus. Thank you very much for listening and I wish you every success in your teaching and lecturing.